I'm Mark Elliott Lugo, curator for the San Diego Public Library. Welcome to Profiles. Our guest today is Neil Shigley, a San Diego artist. He's a painter, a printmaker, a sculptor, an illustrator, who recently caused a major buzz in the San Diego art community. The cause of all the excitement was his subject matter, which was fairly unusual for high art, the homeless. One of the most unusual aspects of Shigley's art career is his dedication to the woodcut printmaking process in both commercial art and fine art applications. In the commercial world, as a graphic designer, Shigley has made a name for himself in the relatively uncommon field of woodcut illustration. In a world dominated by digital tools and manipulation, this hands-on approach is indeed refreshing. In the world of fine art, Shigley's woodcut and plexiglass prints are regarded as truly extraordinary. In Germany, for example, where an exhibition of his prints toured five cities in 1992, Shigley was proclaimed Ein Meister der Holz und Plexischnitt Kunst, in other words, a master of the medium. Join us for a conversation with an artist you'll be hearing much more about in the future, Neil Shigley. I've been following your work for a number of years but I've always thought of you as a painter. Uh, then one day when I was visiting your studio, you pulled out a portfolio of uh, prints from your closet and I couldn't exhibit them fast enough. Uh, why did you keep those prints hidden all those years? After uh, doing prints for so many years, uh, I had taken a bit of a break and uh, kind of devoted myself to painting. We're exhibiting uh, two series of prints by you. Uh, we'll talk about both of them. Uh, in the course of this dialogue, but the first one I want to talk about is the Invisible People series of prints, which is a series that's devoted to uh, images of the homeless. Um, how long have you been working on those? That's been, uh, well, the genesis was maybe three years ago, but uh, actual work about two years. People who come into the gallery are pretty much blown away immediately when they see these uh, large-scale portraits of the homeless, uh, but oftentimes they think they're uh, Dennis Hopper or Janis Joplin, or they're a composite of uh, images. Are these real people? They are. They are uh, individuals, for the most part, uh, in my neighborhood, downtown area, Golden Hill. Uh, one of these fellows I just saw yesterday, so they're, they're around. What made you choose uh, homeless people as a subject for your art? Um, there's really two reasons. Uh, one, the, uh, the character of their faces, um, and I could have chose any group of people, um, but the character of their faces, which was earned through struggle, daily struggle in the street, survival. Um, but there's also the social issue that uh, uh, just bringing to light a situation. What's the first step in the process after you've uh, asked them to pose for you? Is it, do you do drawings of them or is it photographs? Or yeah, I'll take work? photographs, do drawings, and then produce my uh, large drawings to carve from. And um, the fact that they're wood blocks, uh, I try and make the drawing as tight as I can before I carve it because a lot of things happen in the carving that is a little bit out of, out of my control. So I try and be pretty, pretty uh, accurate when I do the drawings. Now these, these images are actually not wood blocks, but they're plexiglass prints Correct, right? for yes. these large ones. We'll get into the wood block issue mm -hmm. later, you mm -hmm. know, but uh, uh, do you uh, pay or compensate these people in any way? Are they going to get rich off you by... Uh, well, uh, if anybody get, gets rich, I would like to see uh, them get rich for sure. Uh, I don't think anybody's been getting rich off this, <laughs> yeah. this project though, but uh, it's a labor of love and I do compensate them when I, when I meet them. Um, enough for lunch or a dinner at least. Uh, um, so the answer is yes. I, at some point people have asked me, are, the, are they invited to the shows? Uh, this is the beginning of this series for me. Mm -hmm. And I like to see it uh, uh, grow a lot. So at some point, I would love to have a, a celebration where they were here as well um, when the time comes. Yeah. Since you have so much experience working with the homeless, uh, is there a really popular misconception about the homeless that you think needs to be corrected? I would say that most people tend to look the other way or try and avoid these people and in some cases maybe for a reason, a good reason. Um, but these people are individuals, they have a life story, they have a family, they have mothers and fathers and sometimes children that uh, care about them. 
Um, they're not discarded people, and the reason uh, the title for this show, The Invisible People, most people want to not, not deal with them. Uh, they view them from their window of their car driving downtown or step over them some night downtown partying. So at this scale, and I chose this scale for a reason, uh, you're confronted with them. You have to deal with them looking in, in this space here. Is there, uh, of the homeless people that you've portrayed so far, has any one of them made a particular impression on you that you'll carry with you for a long time? Well, a number of them have. Uh, there's one individual here that might be just about behind me over here, uh, Henry, who uh, was clear as a bell. Uh, when I approached him, he was at a, between a fence and a wall at a new construction site, um, and he got up and kind of got himself together. and. He was uh, dressed pretty shabbily, uh, but he had a big smile on his face. It was very clear and direct. He was reading a book when I found him, which is kind of unusual. Most of the people that I run into are, uh, are not uh, reading. Mm -hmm. um, but he was very uh, kind of forthright with his questions. I asked him, are you homeless? He said, yeah, circumstances have brought me to this place here. I said, how long have you been out here? He said, 16 years. I said, wow. So, and in the course of the conversation, well, you've seen a lot of changes, yes. He says, as a matter of fact, my brother's working right across the street in that construction site. So it was interesting to, how this family is together here just across the street. Um, and another individual who I haven't uh, carved yet, ready to carve, uh, is, is in my neighborhood around in my backyard almost every day getting cans and bottles. Um, and getting back to your question about misconceptions, some of these people are pretty hardworking people. I see this guy out every morning at six o'clock. He's at my dumpster getting cans. So that sounds like a job to me. But uh, his, uh, his meeting this guy was kind of interesting. I uh, approached him while he was having a sandwich. He offered me half his sandwich. No, thank you. And in, in the conversation, he was pretty weathered. He, uh, he said, I used to be you know, on the other side of the camera. I said, really, what'd you do? He said, well, I was a model. They used to call me exotic. And looking at him, he wasn't, wasn't too exotic at this time, but uh, I could see maybe he had some, uh, in the past, had uh, a good look. But so, some interesting people. These images are limited edition prints, and we've uh, thrown the term around plexiglass print and woodcut. And uh, I studied printmaking in college as an art major, and I'd heard of, you know, serographs and lithographs and intaglio prints and woodcut and, and that sort of thing, but I'd never heard of a plexiglass print before. Uh, what, what is a plexiglass print exactly? It's, it's a block print similar to a wood block where um, the surface is broken and the surface that's remained is inked and printed. Uh, very simple way of saying it, but uh, it's, it's carved just like a wood block, inked and printed. However, the tools are different to carve it. Mm -hmm. um, the plexiglass has its advantages and maybe some disadvantages from wood. In this case, uh, the size of these uh, made plexiglass the choice for me. Um, it, it tends to hold its line a bit better than wood. There's not quite as many uh, accidents or uh, um, happy accidents, I, I, I would say, that uh, a little bit more control over the line work in a plexiglass print as opposed to wood woodcut. You have mentioned that um, that carving into plexiglass is, an ex is extremely difficult and I can only imagine because it's so hard, it's so slippery, I can't even imagine trying mm -hmm. to gouge or chisel out mm -hmm. of a sheet of plexiglass without the, whatever you're using, the tool just skipping all over the place and or wanting to wander off in its own direction. Exactly. So control, I assume, is a very difficult thing to do in terms of controlling line. Is, uh, you use a, a Dremel, did you say, yes. or something mm -hmm. to do with it? Yes, yeah, it's, um, again, wood block and plexiglass printing uh, is very demanding physically. It's, it's, it's labor. Carving and uh, either with a, a gouge or a Dremel tool for the plexiglass. Um, as you said, the, the drill wants to just take off wherever it can go. So the, the effort to control it um, is, is demanding. And plus the vibration, it's shooting up a lot of uh, uh, particles of plexiglass. Uh, it's very loud and aggravating. Uh, for, once, to, once I do some plexiglass printing, getting back in the woodcut is almost like meditating. It's quiet and uh, much easier. Both are physically demanding. Um, 
Uh, plexiglass, though, the actually has maybe a little bit more accurate line than, than the woodcut. As it, it is a hard plastic, so once a line is, is, uh, is carved, it's pretty pretty clean line. So how long does it actually take you to carve? These are pretty large images, and it looks like, as you said, they're labor intensive, but I'm wondering about the amount of time it I takes I would say the them. actual carving of these is maybe five hours. Another thing that really astounds me about your uh, printmaking process is that you don't use a press when you print the uh, final images on paper. You actually uh, burnish them by hand, and that's kind of the old, I guess, is that the old-fashioned way of doing it, or uh, wow, you know, I mean, uh, well, it, tell it, me about it's, that. it's an old-fashioned way for sure. Um, I feel like I have a lot more uh, control and kind of connection to the work. Being involved in a carving as opposed to a painting, um, with all that effort put into every stroke, there's a great connection to the work for me. And this is just another connection, actually rubbing the paper on. After hours and hours of carving, drawing, carving, um, the plates is then inked, and a piece of paper is put on it, and then burnished by hand, either with a, a baron, which is a grass-covered mat, or a spoon. Um, and that can take an hour in itself. So throughout this process, it's only then when the paper is peeled off when I first re really reveal the print. So it's always a pretty exciting time. Um, I could use a press, and uh, at some point I probably will. There is a bit of an inconsistency uh, printing by hand, which I like. In my painting, uh, which is generally abstract and perhaps semi-figurative texture, and spontaneous marks are, are, are something that I strive for. Woodcuts, and maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a minute, but uh, woodcuts, uh, the, the chance for spontaneity isn't quite as much. So in the printing process, if some, again, happy accidents happen where there's an interesting edge that happens through the way I print it, uh, I'm all for it. And I'm assuming that when you pull the first proof that it's not, that you do make adjustments and keep you know, adjusting the image. It's not ready to go after the first carving, right? You Perhaps. You probably make Yes and no. Yes and no. Yes and no. Um, if it's not, I will continue to carve. And many of them require two or three proofs. Sometimes it happens on the first one. And there's another interesting aspect of these uh, large prints, that they're not pure printing, that you have added uh, by hand uh, sort of a painted element. and if we look closely at the images, we'll see in the, I think in the lower right corner of each one of them that there's a, uh, a kind of a, a strange looking symbol, which you, you call the hobo alphabet. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the hobo alphabet? Yeah, this is, these are actual symbols that were, I'm not sure if they're used now, but were used uh, on, with uh, hobos traveling the rails back in the 30s, 40s, 50s. Uh, it's a symbolic language that uh, described uh, attributes of a place or a person. This is a good place to be. It's not a good place to be. Uh, the owner is friendly, not friendly. So it was a way of communicating, um, a very kind of uh, basic communication, but graphic forms um, at their most useful, really, uh, communicating a real uh, specific thing that is important to their survival in some cases.